We have an NFL legend and a current star talking about the league and how it's changed. We're also taking a look at the structural changes in college football and how the new Super League proposal could fix a lot of what's wrong. Plus, we have some MLB stories and the NHL season begins in Prague. It's Friday, October 4th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we have the one and only Joe Montana comparing his era to now and talking about some of his favorite plays and players. We also have the Chicago Bears' Montez Sweat on being on a team in transition and having HBO cameras follow him around for the Hard Knock series. We're also chatting with former college player and coach Adam Brenneman about the major structural issues facing college sports. Plus, the Marlins fired a ton of staffers, the new MLB helmet ads are getting strong reactions, and the NHL season begins at least for two teams. First, let's hit some headlines. We begin with arguably the biggest star in sports right now, as Caitlin Clark took home near-unanimous Rookie of the Year honors on Thursday. Clark received 66 out of 67 possible first-place votes, with the lone exception going to Angel Reese, who set rebounding records before going down with a season-ending wrist injury about a month ago. Clark powered the fever to a league-best attendance and TV ratings this season, and capped it off with the team's first playoff appearance since 2016. History continues in women's basketball. Sticking with hoops, NCAA and NBA parties are brewing a crossover of their own. Sacramento State has been diligently working to join the Pac-12, backed by a group of local politicians and community leaders aptly named the SAC-12, which raised over $35 million in 24 hours last week. As the school constructs a new football stadium, they could get an assist from another local powerhouse. Per Chris Haynes, Sacramento Kings owner Vivek Ranadive has offered the Golden One Center as a site for Sac State basketball in conference games, men's and women's. The arena seats over 17,000 people, which could bode well for a school trying to jump into a more premier conference. Sacramento is already bringing the A's into town during the team's transition period to Las Vegas. They will also share a venue with the Ranadive-owned team, the Rivercats, which are the Giants AAA affiliate. The King's owner is lending out a space in an attempt to elevate Sacramento as a sports city. On the subject of owners, the Miami Dolphins could have new ones in the near future, although to be clear, the infamous Stephen Ross is still expected to hold on to his majority stake in the franchise. Instead, Ross plans to sell 10% of the Finns, the F1 Miami Grand Prix, and Hard Rock Stadium to Aries Management, marking the first private equity sale in NFL history. Nets owner Joe Tsai will also be a part of this deal, purchasing an additional 3%. The stakes are being sold at a price that places an $8.1 billion valuation on this premier trio of assets. Not quite the $10 billion that the Dallas Cowboys are valued at, but a massive figure nonetheless, especially for a team that's just 1-3 to start the season. Meanwhile, Raiders coach Antonio Pierce is having a wild few weeks, first calling out his team to the media after a beatdown loss to the Carolina Panthers, and now he's got the NCAA knocking at his door with sanctions. Pierce was issued an eight-year show cause order for over-recruiting violations from his time as an Arizona State assistant coach over a scheme to sidestep COVID-19 restrictions during recruitment for which he was the, quote, ringleader. Gets worse, though. The report alleges that Pierce used his position of authority to pressure staff members into engaging in violations, often by instilling fear that they would lose their jobs if they did not follow his orders. As long as Pierce remains in the NFL, he shouldn't be substantially impacted by this. But with the way the Raiders season is going, that's a big if. Conor McGregor is not making his return to fighting yet, at least not against Terrence Crawford. On Wednesday, Crawford revealed that he and McGregor were offered a two-fight contract by Saudi Arabia's General Entertainment Authority, but turned it down because of concerns over fighting in the octagon. Despite the reported hundreds of millions they would have been paid for the fights, Crawford, who has no experience in MMA, said in an interview with Bernie the Boxer that he and McGregor spoke on the phone, but he told the two champion, I'm not getting in no effing octagon with you so you can be kicking and elbowing me. McGregor is still expected to fight for UFC in 2025. Joe Montana was the face of football in the 80s and the first part of the 90s. He's still very engaged with the game and has plenty of insights on football in every era. I caught up with him on how his era compares to this one, who he enjoyed playing with and against, and what he's up to now. Here's our conversation. I'm joined now by four-time Super Bowl winner, two-time MVP, three-time Super Bowl MVP, Joe Montana. Welcome, Joe. Hey, thanks, Owen. Appreciate your time. Yeah, appreciate your time. Great to have you on. So plenty to talk about, including your work in the healthcare space. But let's start with football. So last Super Bowl featured your two former teams, the 49ers and Chiefs, both still top contenders. Uh, what it's like been like for you to watch these two very strong, but very differently built teams go up against each other? <clears throat> What's well, fun in some ways and not fun in other ways. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, um, 
but I think both both teams have the capability of getting back there again. Um, you know, the 49ers have had some uh, physical issues here early in the season, and hopefully they get past that. Um, they remain healthy for the rest of the season, and um, the Chiefs just continue to be a machine like they always, like they've been in the past for so many years. So, a um, little different offenses and different, two couple different, two different quarterback styles, but um, both have been very productive. And uh, like I said, they're they're fun to watch. And, yeah. Hard to watch together, but <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, and yeah, just thinking about those teams, I feel like, and you, you, you actually be curious your thoughts here. I feel like Purdy is maybe more like the sort of quarterback you were. Um, I mean, Mahomes is a pretty unique figure, but um, but the Chiefs' offense feels more like maybe more like what what you had um back in in your days. I'm wondering what you th- feel like are the biggest differences between just like the style of play when you are playing versus what you see now. The one thing you, you never saw from us was a shotgun. Uh-huh. <laughs> we, we tried it one time and they snapped the ball like three feet over my head. <laughs> and that was the last time we did it. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I, I think the styles are pretty, I mean, the offensive styles are a little bit familiar with each other. You know, there's, yeah, they, they have the capability of getting the ball down the field. They all have playmakers on both sides, but not afraid to make quick decisions to dump the ball underneath, and especially on first downs. You, you got an active tight end, you know, on both teams, and uh, um, guys that been, are able to quickly find holes and sit down or continue to run. Uh, I think it's probably the most difficult thing for receivers uh, to learn. Um, like, you know, in our offense – just because it was called a crossing route didn't mean you were going to cross the field. You know, you had to, you could sit down, you could stop and slide, go back the other way, you could do a lot of things. And so the ability for the receivers to understand that and transfer it to the quarterback um, on both sides of the ball, on both, for both teams, I should say, um, mm-hmm. it, it's pretty good. I mean, like I said, you got to back, catch the ball. Um, Obviously, got some pretty good wide receivers on both sides, and um, so you'll yeah. see, I think, similar style of offense. Well, not from the quarterback play, because one's a lot more active than the other. And he likes to throw it sidearm, underarm, behind his back, and whatever mm-hmm. he can to get it done. But um, mm-hmm. and Purdy's probably a little more traditional, you know, yeah, in the pocket and runs what can run uh, when he has to, and, and yeah. get on the ground. They both like mm-hmm. to get down because <laughs> yeah, they want to go right. up for the next play. So you played from 1979 to 94. The NFL is popular, of course, then, but I don't think it was the dominant force in the sports world that it is today. What was it like being one of the faces of the league back then? Well, it was fun. I mean, the game was, um, it obviously changed a little bit since then. And But if you look back about the same distance between when I played and before me, it, it changed a lot from that period of time, too. So um we had you know we had some we had some good pretty good teams and in which obviously makes it makes it a lot more fun to play when you when you're winning um but uh some pretty good rivalries with like the the rams and and the uh, the giants and um so it, it just and the cowboys you gotta throw those guys in there but i like to forget okay. about but <laughs> they, well, you gotta put them in there but um I don't know. It's just it, you don't really think about it when you're playing. You know, you, you just know that you're having fun and um, you're just trying your best to get back to another Super Bowl, especially after you win one. Um, that's there's an excitement about that game that uh, it makes you want to get back to it fast. Yeah. There are a lot of risks to players that we're more aware of than we used to be. I mean, concussions being the obvious one. How do you think about your playing days in light of what we know now? But, I mean, I don't think I think concussion stuff is 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 a difficult situation, and they, they're trying. I just read something this morning that I didn't get through the whole article, but the the players are complaining about that pad that goes over their helmet. Yeah. Now, and the the thing is, like, you can't. I don't know how you stop the concussion thing. And what, um, and what, when your head hits something first, it, your brain, your helmet may soften the blow a little bit, 
But the problem is your brain is still moving forward when your head stops. And until you can figure out how to stop your brain from moving inside your skull, then it's going to be concussions are going to happen in that game because it, you know, it's a physical game and it's a contact game. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they're more aware of it now. They used to ask you if you could remember your name back then or what kind of car you were driving. And then you could answer, you could go back in. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, these things have improved in yeah. that realm. Um, so now you're using your platform, you know, in the health space to make sure people are protecting themselves from pneumonia. Tell me about the work you're doing there and why it resonates with you. Yeah, yeah, it's been a great partnership with Pfizer. And, and you know, the one thing we're trying to do is get people to learn and understand their risks of, of uh, pneumococcal pneumonia and invasive pneumococcal disease. And, um, and that... You know, you can, there's a vaccination against it to help prevent it. And, you know, it, I really learned about it after I turned 65 and I became more at risk. And you find out that, wow, um, people who are younger than me, 19 to 64, can still be at, at a higher risk if they had certain underlying conditions in which, like asthma or diabetes or, or things of that nature. And that puts you at a higher risk. And so, you know, I, I try to be on the forefront of, of my health these days, and um, I want to continue to, as they say, still look down at the grass. So I try to take care of myself and and try to be proactive. And so when I got vaccinated, uh, got the vaccination, and what we're just trying to get people to realize is, hey, hey, if you think you're in that category, talk to your doctor talk or your pharmacist. Or um, they've got a great website for people to go to at um, vaxassist.com, and that's vaxassist.com. Um, a lot of good information. You can even schedule uh, your vaccination on it. Yeah, yeah. I actually had um, I had interstitial pneumonia last year, and you know it was fine. I got antibiotics. It was okay, but it was a little scary for for a day or two. And um, yeah, no, I wish I was eligible for the vaccine, um, which you know I will be eventually. Um, before we let you go, I want to just throw a few quick lightning round questions at you. Uh, what's your favorite thing about being a retired NFL player? Uh, uh, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Get to sleep, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. Uh, oh, it's a favorite moment from uh, an NFL game that you played in other than a Super Bowl. Um, I think the, the, I threw a touchdown against the Philadelphia Eagles in a, in a game back in Philly that, um, all we needed was a first down to pick up to win the game. And we ran a little route with the back and he was sitting there wide open. And you could see my big head coach at the time, as soon as I let the ball go over the head of, the, of him and to Jerry Rice, his eyes went up and, and looking and they ended up scoring a touchdown. And when I got to the sideline, he said, oh, you're lucky that was a touchdown. Because <laughs> the back was wide open. Yeah. I said, I know, I know, <laughs> but I had Jerry Rice, so it's good. Yeah, right. Yeah, I was going to ask you who your favorite player to play with would be, but I'd kind of be shocked if it wasn't Jerry. Yeah, I, I mean, there were, I had a lot of great teammates, you know, obviously Jerry, fun play, I would play with, John Taylor, I mean, Brent Jones, Roger Craig, I mean, yeah, you can just go on. Everybody yeah. had a little special thing, I mean, defense, you know, Ronnie, I mean, Eric, I mean, those guys changed the way we played defense when they came on the team, and you know, it's nice because we've got a lot of guys that still live here. So we get together uh, every month or two when we can scrape everybody together. And so um, have a dinner somewhere and have make up some old stories that keep getting embellished as we get older. Sounds good. Uh, favorite player to play against? Um, <clears throat> Lawrence Taylor. Oh, wow. Believe it or not, not, I mean, there's one that you didn't want to play against, but, you know, everybody talks about defense and dirty guys, but he was, he was special. I mean, he was a special guy where you can't, you can't block him with your tackle. He's too fast. You can't block him with your back. He's too strong. And you can't run away from him because he runs things down from behind. But, and he laughs, and, but, he, but he's like me. He'll laugh and joke, and he'll talk to you while, you're, while the game's going on. But uh, just about anything or, or or he goes, I'm gonna, I got that. I'm gonna get that one the next time you do that. And then, so uh, I'll get ready. It's coming in here in a little bit. So it, it was just a fun, very, very competitive. Uh, we were, were with them, 
uh, when he played, but uh, fun player to play against. Yeah. And last one, something that players today should be jealous of from you know the game when you were playing. Nothing. <laughs> they, they got it all. They have it. They have it pretty well covered. Right now, so yeah, we, I think we're jealous of where they are, <laughs> especially quarterbacks. We want to throw it. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Joe Montana, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for joining us on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it. The Marlins are hitting the reset button. The team informed their entire coaching staff that they will not be retained. The cuts actually began in August when the team let go of assistant GMs, field coordinators, and their international scouting director, among others. In all, more than 70 Marlins employees have been shown the door. This club is now a blank slate for owner Bruce Sherman and president of baseball operations Peter Bendix, who took over for Kim Ng earlier this year. If things don't improve from here, then maybe it wasn't those 70 employees who are the real problem. Meanwhile, ESPN reports that its day one wildcard round numbers are up 15% since last year per Nielsen. The four games averaged 2.5 million viewers and peaked with 6.7 million around 5.30 p.m. This includes the most watched wildcard game ever on ESPN, the Detroit Tigers and AL Cy Young favorite Tarek Skubal defeating the Astros 3-1. Those big viewership numbers are good news for a certain German apparel company. MLB helmets are now adorned with the Strauss logo. Unlike jersey patches, helmet logos are harder to ignore, which is good for Strauss, but not great for the overall aesthetics of the game. It's also an interesting choice on both ends to pick a brand that is introducing itself to the American audience rather than a known commodity. And while we're here, MLB has had a very strange group of advertisers at its biggest moments. Its first umpire patch went to FTX, a company that is now being dealt with by the federal government's umpires. The All-Star Game was sponsored by BuildSubmarines.com, because if there's one thing missing from the average baseball fan's life, it's a submarine. And now you can't go on the MLB website without seeing Charlotte's Web everywhere, which is the league's first CBD sponsor. MLB is apparently the league for people who want to enjoy non-psychoactive cannabis in their submarine while wearing German workwear and purchasing crypto. To the NFL, Lamar Jackson sounded off on a new kind of fan abuse he's been receiving. The day after beating the Bills, 35-10, to 10, the Ravens QB took to X to write, This is a team sport. I'm not out here satisfied when I throw for 300 yards but took a L. If I throw for 50 yards and we win, that's W2EF matters. Y'all stop commenting on our socials about the yards y'all fan duel or parlays ain't hit. Jackson is hardly the first player to go public about fans complaining to them because they didn't hit their parlays or their team didn't make the spread or whatever. This is already a real problem that has emerged in the sports betting era, and I hope leagues are actively working to address this. But also, I think this is a sign that sports betting is already changing how games are played. Probably not too dramatically, but let's say you're a running back in the fourth quarter of a blowout game. Let's say you got some abuse on social media because last week you fell just short of 200 yards and now you're at 190. Some people wouldn't care, but others would be thinking about those last 10 yards when they get their next carry or even when their coach talks to them about taking the rest of the game off. There are guardrails up that usually catch corrupt actors, but the subtler impacts of sports betting are much harder to see and much harder to stop. Montez Sweat is leading the Chicago Bears defense after being traded last year from the Washington Commanders. We spoke about what it's like being on a team seeking to emerge out of some darker days, what it was like having the Hard Knocks camera crew follow them around everywhere, and he gives us opinions, not all of them positive, on the new NFL rules. That conversation's next. I'm joined now by Chicago Bears defensive end Montez Sweat. Welcome, Montez. How y'all doing? Yeah, doing great. Thanks so much for, for coming on. Um, so the Chicago Bears, you know, they're a team in transition. You've got your your big quarterback. What's it like being kind of on a team that's that's kind of finding its way but is on the rise? Yeah, man, it's fun. Uh, you finding out uh, finding out new guys and how they uh, operate uh, during the year, and uh, we're still trying to find our identity a little bit. I think we got a good idea of what, of what we want to be, but we're still uh, on the on the on the rise of that. I man, I think it's. The beauty in the journey is is the is the best part about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, you guys were that that journey was chronicled partly uh, through the, you know you had the hard knock series in your training camp. Uh, what was it like? You know, not just having people following you everywhere on the field and watching every move there, but also watching every move that would normally be kind of more kept internal. 
Yeah, man, it's uh, I mean, it's it's great for the for the for the outside uh to to get a dive into what really goes on in day to day in a uh, NFL facility. I mean, but I I think for the guys in the in the locker room, man, we really just want to kind of hone in on our job and our process and uh really just winning football games. But I mean, we love giving the fans the experience to uh in the locker room and all those type of things. But uh. I'm kind of glad they, they they out of the locker room now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it would be something of a distraction, even if you're just trying to act as natural as you can. Like, they would probably say things, not like offensive things or anything, but just things you might not want completely public. Um, but there's cameras right there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of like you're kind of living through, a, living through a filter when you're at work a little bit. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's fun. You interact with the guys that's, uh, that's working and uh, create new relationships. So it was great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this a little bit with, um, you may have seen Baker Mayfield said something about how, like, you know, things are a little bit looser now that I'm the QB instead of Tom Brady. And Tom Brady said, well, you know, I wanted to win a championship. And it kind of became this, like, something out of nothing. Um, is that something that, like, you guys have to always have somewhere in the back of your head that, like, anything you say could kind of spin into something bigger? I mean, I think that's a that's a mindset that any professional athlete uh, needs to have. Where, uh, we're under a different microscope. Uh, anything... We say can be used. You, I'm not playing, <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah. I mean, you gotta uh, you gotta watch what you say, man. But I try to be as uh, authentic and honest as, as possible. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, it's a you know a give and take. And people on my end, you know, we want the most honest, raw stuff we can get. At the same time, you're human beings, and you know, you're just trying to do your job. Um, uh, if I can ask, uh, you you were traded last year from the Commanders. Um, how, what was that experience like for you? Oh uh, man, it's different. Um, think about just, uh, moving your whole life in the middle of the year to, a, uh, to a whole nother state. Uh, it was cool. Uh, the, the transition process is, is rocky, but I mean, you still got a job to do and you want to do that at a high level. So, uh, just trying to get your, yourself back acclimate, acclimated to, um, uh, where you at? I think the guys in the locker room made that very, very easy for me. Um, and also the coaches, uh, it was just a, a great environment to come into, man. And, um, I'm still living off that hot. Um, so you had your first annual football camp this summer. Uh, tell me about that. And yeah, what, what inspired you to do that? Man, that was great. Uh, I hosted a football camp actually at the, uh, the park that I grew up playing in the, uh, my, uh, way Walker park, the park that I, just started playing football at, uh, was able to see some, uh, some old coaches, a lot of family, a lot of family and friends that came out and just, uh, uh, players that was in the same position that, that I was in as a young kid. So, uh, that was great to give back to the community mm -hmm. that yeah. I grew up in. And, right. Yeah. Um, and you're also having a community impact through, uh, you're working with Campbell's. Tell me about that. Yeah. Uh, so I partnered with, uh, Campbell's Chunky, uh, there donating a thousand mils across America for every sack that uh, any player gets across the league. I'm in the business of getting sacks, so I just thought it was going to be a great partnership, and uh, I plan on getting a lot of meals across America uh, over the season. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, and, and thinking more broadly, what kind of impact do you want to have off the field? Yeah, man, I mean, I want to be, be a guy that uh, impacts his community. Uh, I just want to be a, a person that can uh, – just do a lot of things in the community as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. And getting back to the NFL, you know, it's been, you know, a bunch of season, uh, a season where there's been a bunch of changes from the league, you know, the, the hip chop tackle is now banned. Um, the, uh, you know, got the new kickoff, all the leagues always in the, you know, even people, um, you know, got the, the guardian caps are, <laughs> are making their way into the league to try to protect players' heads. Um, What's the most notable for you in terms of how the game is shifting? Um, I think it starts off with how the game starts. The the kickoff, the new kickoff is uh is different. It's very uh, you know, shock and shed. It's very I don't know. It's I really like the old kickoff better to be honest. With oh, you. Yeah. It was it was it was more exciting. Um, but it seems like it'll be more easier to beat it to beat a guy on a on a new kickoff. I guess that's a. a that's one thing. It's really a lot of changes. The guardian caps is another thing. We see we see somebody with that guardian cap on out there, man. We're going to say they soft. 
<laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> not gonna lie, but uh, but I get it. Uh, you you want to uh, protect yourself, uh, minimize the concussions and all that type of thing. So, shout out to the league for uh, giving guys that uh, that leeway to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm all for them. I mean, I think you know concussions are. It, look, it looks a little weird no just when you first see it, but I get it. Yeah, 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 exactly. I think a lot of things look weird at first, but like, I don't know if you like. Um, a lot of the equipment you wear now probably would look strange if it was the first time you ever saw it. Um, and so I'm hoping we get used to the Guardian caps and more guys feel comfortable wearing them because, um, you know, I think they could they should be wearing clown makeup if it protected them from concussions. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you're in one of the, the toughest divisions. You know, you've got the Vikings, the Lions, the, you know, the Packers are, are up and coming. Um you know, what's it like, you know, just having to to both find your identity as a team, but also with some really tough competition? Well, I mean, credit credit to the schedule. We don't get into division play until about week 10 of, of this year. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the de- the division is definitely talented. Uh, we got Minnesota, who uh, I was thinking really wasn't going to be that well this year. It's actually looking like one of the one of the better teams in the league uh, with Sam Donald. So, um, yeah. And uh, obviously the Packers and and Detroit uh, looking well. So uh, I mean, it's a challenge. You want you want you want to be in that, that division where the where the talent is at. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And finally, and you're one of uh, kind of a lot of teams right now that have a rookie quarterback or a very young quarterback who's not only being asked to learn the league you know, become an NFL player, but also to lead a team. Do you think we're putting too much on some of these these up and coming players? I mean, it's it's hard to say. Uh, a quarterback is is a quarterback. And I mean, at some point you gotta you gotta jump off the porch, man. You gotta dive into the deep end and uh make those leaps. Some some quarterbacks are being asked to be to do it earlier than others. But I mean it is what it is. So uh you got to do what you got to do. But, uh, I mean, I'm very confident in Caleb. He's getting better and better week to week. You know the talent's there. It's just uh, all about the operation and um, moving forward. Yeah. All right. Really appreciate the time. Montez Sweat, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, man. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bioage. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. With college sports in a huge state of upheaval, some are looking for holistic solutions that would reshape the sport. My next guest, CBS and Yahoo Sports analyst Adam Brenneman, is someone who believes that a broad restructuring is needed, but he's not especially confident in the NCAA's ability to make that happen. I'm joined now by Adam Brenneman, analyst at Yahoo Sports and CBS Sports. Welcome, Adam. Oh, I appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, great to have you on. Uh, bunch of topics in the college football world uh let's start with matt sluka and unlv so just to review for our listeners he red shirts off the unlv unlv roster he's their starting quarterback no more uh the reporting is that he was promised a hundred thousand dollars at least that's what he's saying and got a small fraction of that unlv is now saying they're not doing business with him or his family ever again i keep feeling like there's some piece of the story we don't know publicly right now what's your take on this whole situation this is what happens when schools and football programs are have to make NIL promises for recruiting, but ultimately those schools and programs don't control the NIL collectives and the actual and the actual facilitation of those NIL deals. I mean, that's they're they're legally not allowed to yet, and that's part of what's try, what's in, in court with the with the revenue sharing and the settlement with the NCAA. But 
you know, the reality is, and I spent time coaching, right, as NIL was, was, was coming into the fold, these coaches are really the ones deciding, just like a general manager, where their NIL money is going, to what players it's going to, and they're agreeing on these, on these verbal agreements with these players of you're going to make $100,000. Hey, if you transfer here, we can get you $250,000. But as you know, and the school's not the one paying the players. It's a separate entity, NIL Collective, that is not allowed to have any association with the school. And that entity, acts, which is a bunch of donors usually, is the one actually facilitating those contracts with the players. So it's a, it's a complete mess. Uh, and it's easy to see how this happens, right? You get an agent and a player who talks to a school. And then the actual collective, which is a whole separate entity, is the one that has to fulfill it. And if, if any communication is missed, and if, any, if the collective then – doesn't have the funds to pay it, then there's no formal agreement and it just kind of falls apart. And now what's happened is Matt Saluka has said, I'm worth more money. Uh, if I'm not getting what I'm promised, why would I risk injury? Why would I keep playing? Why would I waste my eligibility and leave money on the table? So I see both sides of it. I, it, it, it is hard to imagine walking away from your teammates in the, in the middle of the season, but I also haven't been in Matt Saluka's shoes where you have money on the table. You feel like you were promised something by the coaches and it can't be fulfilled. And then you almost got to feel for the coaches too. Like the coaches don't control what the NIL sure. collective does. So it's a mess all the way around. Yeah. And, and this is all still in the realm of like handshake agreements, essentially. Right. And like, because nothing is really being written down as a formal contract where you can take it to a judge and say like, look, I was promised this much and I got that much. Right. Yeah, it, exactly. And it's, it's interesting because you hear these coaches say, you know, uh, Ryan Day at Ohio State talked about their NIL budget of what, $15 million. And then James Franklin at Penn State said, well, if their budget's 15 million, then our budget should be 15 million because you want us to beat Ohio State. But the NIL budget is really with the NIL collective, which is outside the school, outside the control of the, of the coaches. And then the coaches are, are deciding where that money goes, but ultimately they don't have any legal control over where that money goes. So the coaches can't sign the contracts. The administration of the school can't sign the contracts. It has to then go pa be passed on to the, to the collective. But really the coaches are the ones making decisions of where the money and how it gets split up with everyone. So like when, when the players want more money, they're going into their head coach's office to ask for, for more money. And then the coach has to relay, relay that to the, to the NIL collective. So, uh, and, it's all kind of getting figured out right now. And this is part of the issue with NIL. When NIL came into came to the fold, came to be in college sports, everyone thought NIL would be doing a deal, the quarterback doing a deal with their with the car dealership for, you know, ten thousand dollars and right. the offensive lineman going to do a deal with the local restaurant. What's what it's become is straight pay for play. And I'm yeah. okay with that. I think a lot of people are. Like players should be getting paid in college sports, but there's no there's no guidelines in the 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 NIL collective piece of this without being and, and not being able to have those collectives associated with the school or managed by the school is a mess. And that's going to change very soon. And we're already seeing some state law start to change around it. Yeah. And I think it has to change because yeah. and we've got this this weird split that you're highlighting here where it's like the the conferences are getting all this money and they're just, it just trickles down to the school through their media deals. But the money going yeah. to the players is from donors. And yeah. so, and also there's this, this competition of like, yeah, Ohio state got, got, has this much money. So we have to have it too. Um, at the same time, donors are being hit up for millions of dollars every single year to up the ante on each other. And, yeah. um, but it doesn't, it, but some of them are just saying, you know, I just gave you a million dollars. Like you, you can't come back to me right now. You just hit the nail on the head with that point right there. Donor fatigue is starting to set in at an yeah. all time high in college football and college basketball as well. And what happens is in year one of NIL, when you go to your big donor and say, we need a million dollars to, to bring in this player, the donor is fired up. Oh, we can finally buy players and get them to come in all in. But what happens in year two and three when the team went four and eight and didn't win a national championship, the donor says, I just gave you a million dollars last year and what it didn't get me anything. So the fatigue starts to set in. And now, oh, and add in the revenue sharing coming to college college sports and power four conferences where, the, where every athletic department will have be able to pay their players 20 some million dollars in these athletic departments and collectives have a major revenue issue. And they have to figure out how to drive more revenue and create that NIL revenue you know, one, one piece is revenue sharing. One piece is actual NIL money. When every school pays their players $20 million in revenue sharing, essentially no one's special. And now everyone still needs to create other money through NIL 
to pay their players on top of that. So it creates this revenue issue where every athletic department, every school is trying to figure out how to maximize revenue. And it's going from donor funded to really revenue producing for athletic departments. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I never want to cut off avenues for players to get paid, especially in this case, when they, yeah. you know, for decades, they uh, were the free labor, essentially, I mean, you know, with scholarships and all that. But, I, know, I got I, I got no money, man, in my in my career. Yeah, so I, I wish. I... <laughs> You're right, exactly. Um, at the same time, I wonder if once we have revenue sharing, and maybe it could even be like an NBA type split where it's like, they know the percentage that is going to the players, like, you know, it's 50 50 or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, and they can take their NIL deals with with big brands and their local restaurants. Um, but to have donor money that is going, you know, through a couple of conduits to the players, um, I don't want to, like, necessarily cut it off. But at the same time, it does feel like it creates this unsustainable competition between donors. And probably that money is going to find its way to players one way or another. But um, I feel like there's other places donor money can go as well, like through training facilities or just like the school itself. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know what the solution is all, all, all the way around. I mean, every piece of it is an issue right now. And I talk to athletic directors all the time who are saying what you just said, the the with now the 20 million dollars going to come into the fold pretty soon in revenue sharing and schools need to come up with that other 20 million that they're that they're paying their players. The question becomes, do we want our donors paying the NIL collective a million dollars to pay our to pay the players on top of the revenue sharing? Right. NIL is different than revenue sharing. There's still the need to pay players outside of it. Uh, or do we want that money going to facilities and the excellence fund and funding our you know on campus projects? So that that's that's certainly an issue in in for NIL. And I, I think really the other piece of this. And it happened in the Matt Sluka situation at UNLV is that there's so many agents and people in these players ears. But when, when it comes to NFL agents, those agents have to be licensed. They have to go through screening. They have to be approved by the NFL PA. Right now, there is no screening, no licensing, no requirements to be an NIL agent in college football. So what you have is a bunch of a bunch of people basically deciding they're all of a sudden an NIL agent and taking a cut of these players earnings. Sometimes up the, I mean, I've seen contracts with 25% uh, kickback wow. or you know, fee to agents on their NIL deals yeah. and they don't have any training. They don't know what they're doing. And clearly the agent in the Matt Sluka situation wasn't licensed in the state. He was, he was doing the uh, you know, some of these deals in from a l legal standpoint uh, didn't, get the contract in writing with the collective, which is a huge mistake. So there needs to be some better representation for these athletes as the money gets bigger, as more and more money flows in the system and it gets more complicated. And my last point on it is just, I do think that it's a good thing that we're in, It's a good issue to have that there's money yeah. in the, in the system for the players for a long time. This has been a business for the administrators, for the media networks, for the, for the, for the TV channels, for the coaches, for the brands involved. And it's about time it's a business for the players too, but right now it's a mess and someone needs to take control and, and figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. With you there. Um, let's hit some. So like, amidst all these structural changes, the conferences themselves are also um, sort of looking both to take advantage of this and also kind of find their place. The SEC and Big Ten um, recently we, we learned are trying to, as part of kind of new scheduling deals, media deals, um, trying to guarantee themselves spots in the college football playoff. So now that there's 12 spots to go around, each of them want four. Probably each of them are going to get four in, in most years, but to have a guaranteed spot to me feels kind of anathema to what the CFP is supposed to be. What do you think? Man, I, I, I hear you and I hear that argument. I, I would say, I think that the one argument against it and really where I think I come, I land on the issue is that, the, the, the difference in competition between the Big Ten and the SEC and then the Big 12 and the ACC, it's such a huge gap in college football right now. And really the Big Ten and the SEC have become the two power conferences in college football. And for them to have the same representation as the Big 12 and the ACC doesn't feel right to me because you look at the schedule, you look at what's going on in the, AC, in the, in the ACC and the Big 12, and it's just not the same level of football. And by having – one automatic bid for each of those four conferences and kind of treating them all the same. It's almost a disservice to some of the teams in the big 10 of the sec who aren't getting that, that automatic bid that then have to compete for those at large spots with, uh, with the ACC and the big 12. So 
if we want a better product for college football, I think that the, that the Big Ten and the SEC getting more guaranteed, more automatic spots is fitting. And, and it makes sense with kind of where it's going and where college football is going as kind of more focused super conferences and uh, more national from an approach. It also helps the Big Ten and the SEC. We all know why they're doing this. Media deals, scheduling, I mean, just kind of uh, better for their conference more advertising and sponsorship opportunities. So they want the more, the automatic spots. And, and, but I do think it's warranted based on the actual on field play that we've seen and how it's going to continue in college football. Yeah, I hear that. I guess my, where I'm coming from is like, you're certainly right for what's happening, right? For the you know state of college football yeah. right now. I just feel like, we could be looking at this in 10 years and like maybe the big 10 kind of falls off and it's like, but they just have these four spots locked in that, um, I, I just feel like, you know, it should move toward meritocracy, I guess. And this, this feels like just them claiming two thirds of the spots. And of course yeah. the CFP itself might grow uh, and it wouldn't be two thirds anymore, but it just feels like too much to, to hand out. Um, but I, I think we're kind of like, you know, sort of on the same, same page. Yeah. There. Well, and, and, and to, to your point, uh, the argument against what I just said is that, Hey, if the big 10, and the sec are so elite, then they should be getting most of the at large spots anyway. Right. And right. most of those spots, they should be the ones making the playoff, which I mean, this season, it looks like, I mean, we'll probably have four big 10, possibly sec teams to play off this season. So uh, it, it, it should all play out the way it is, but you know, the, I think the, and we may get into this, the, the kind of, trend in college football and college basketball is that these power teams kind of joining together at the top and leaving everyone yep. else behind and and figuring that hey if we can be in one big conference together look at the big 10 the sec that it's more valuable for everybody than it is being broken off in these you know kind of not as great lesser conferences yeah well along those lines so we we just saw this report from the athletic that there now with some administrators and other folks kind of making these deals are proposing essentially like a, a super league yeah. where you'd have 72 FBS schools uh, in one group with regional divisions. So we get some regional playback mm -hmm. and then 64 group of eight schools are calling them and we'd have promotion and relegation. Um, it feels like the sort of organization that I think makes a lot of sense. I, again, the SEC and big 10, maybe other conferences might have a thing or two to say about this. But as a goal, I think I like it. Yeah, I like it. I, I haven't read the fine detail of what they're they're presenting. I, I saw the article that that we're that you you mentioned. You know, the 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 part I like about it is there needs to be a governing body overseeing college football. Clearly, the NCAA has shown that they are incapable of being the administrators in 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 charge of college sports. I mean, there there is zero control from them on on really any any compliance type needs. I mean, investigations take four years to get done. Uh, they they botch NIL when this came into to the fold. So no one really respects the NCAA anymore, and they've kind of taken a hands off approach on a lot of this because they're getting crushed in court from a antitrust and and, and situations like that. So. There needs to be some kind of governing body. So I like how this proposal of this kind of Super League, you know, gives a some governing say to a board uh, with a commissioner overseeing the league. Oh, and I've said a bunch, and I, I think it is so crazy that the people in charge of college football are really the conference commissioners, right? Greg Sankey, right. At the S commissioner of the SEC, is really in charge of college football as well as the commissioner of the Big Ten. But the problem is that Greg Sankey also – is in charge of basketball and field hockey and swimming and diving and track and field. He also has to report, has, has to oversee those and make sure good things are happening for those sports as well. So there's no one who looks after college football and makes sure college football, uh, and same with college basketball, Scott, makes sure college football is getting a fair share and making sure things are going well, making sure that, that, uh, that, you know, even compliance and issues that have to do with the schools and NIL and transport, that all that's going well. There's no one overseeing it right now that is solely focused on college football. That to me is crazy when it's a business as big as what college football is. And this kind of proposal would put a commissioner in place and would a, would allow college football to break off as kind of a a its own league and and govern itself that way, the way it really should be for how big of a business it is. Yeah, and on the that other side, some of these other sports are just getting dragged along in the whole conference realignment, you know, mess. Um, yeah. And they don't want any part of this. They, they liked Crazy. their previous situation. And, you know, yeah. some of them have kind of carved out their own 
world, but like it, it should just be a formal split, I think, where yeah, college yeah. football is its own thing. It's arguably the second biggest, you know, sport uh, or the league, whatever you want to call it, other than the NFL in the US. So yeah, and it should be treated as such in, in a kind of a more like formally organized way. Again, it's there's going to be a lot of sausage making, and we'll we'll see what actually happens here because there isn't a controlling body like the NCAA yeah. that can just say this is what we're doing now. Like it's um, it, yeah, it, it really seems like there's a new report every day based on conference realignment and NIL and portal. It's a fun time, especially for people like you to cover the sport. And uh, we got exactly. you know Pac-12 expansion. We I thought the Pac-12 was dead just a few weeks ago, and now yeah. Pac-12 is coming back. back with with uh, with some vengeance. So it, it, it's going to be fun to see how it all plays out. I I will say I college football a year from now will look very different than what it looks like right now. And I, I don't think the, I think conference realignment will continue. I think the SEC and big 10 are going to continue to try to expand when it makes sense and continue to eat up other schools until, you know, until what we just talked about happens where a super league forms and college football breaks off into its own kind of entity that, that governs it itself. Yeah. Should be fun to watch. Yeah. Adam Brenneman. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks Owen. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. The NHL season begins today. While most teams start play on Tuesday or Wednesday next week, the Devils and Sabres are playing two games in Prague. In November, the Panthers and Stars will play in Finland. Overseas regular season games are now practically required as an annual event for every major league. The NFL started its season in Brazil and makes regular trips to Europe. They eventually want to get to 16 overseas games per year. In their past seasons, the NBA went to Paris and Mexico City, and MLB also went to Mexico City, Seoul, and London. For now, the NHL seems most interested in places where hockey is a top sport. The U.S. market isn't fully tapped out, but there is a lot more potential beyond our borders. That's it for today. Watch out for our new weekend interview series, which will feature voices from around the sports world speaking with my colleagues at FOS. Thanks for listening, and I don't usually say this on Fridays. We'll see you tomorrow.